Great to have you here today in this wonderful building in Senate House, which was um, the Ministry of Information in the Second World War and was in the film of George Orwell's 1984 as the Ministry of Truth. So it's a great building and I hope we have a great conference as well. Um, the research that we've been working on is to do with languages and development. And what we've been doing in this particular research is looking at archives talking to people, interviewing them, both people who work in the UK and people who work outside the UK. And when I'm moving into the third phase of the project, which will be looking at particular case studies in Malawi, Peru, and Kyrgyzstan. We're very excited about the seminar today because I think it's one of the first times that certainly we've been able to bring together practitioners in, tran in translation and development, translation scholars, and we have some very eminent and, 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 and innovative scholars here today, and also translating um, MA translations tutors who are training the next generation. I think that from our point of view, that there are four major objectives in this seminar. The first is to raise awareness and understanding of what it's like translating in NGOs in development. And that seems to me to be a major thing to do. The second objective that we have is to try to see what synergies there are between translation studies, scholarship, and the, the work of practitioners in NGOs in development the kind of research questions that could be asked, which will be helpful to practitioners as well as to translation studies. Thirdly, we're interested to see the extent to which the very good MAs that we have in the UK in, in training translators are able to incorporate material that comes from development, might want to see interface between NGOs and their own students. And lastly, and I think most importantly of all, we hope that this seminar today will enable us to get some clear views on practical things that can support translators who are working in development. So we hope that it will produce some practical things which will support our colleagues. So that's a big agenda. It's a big agenda for a dialogue, for a seminar, but I think we could start off with the first panel. Ian. Thank you, Ian. Um, well, welcome to everyone. I'm very happy to see such a full room because with three events like this, you never really know what the turnout is going to be. So I must say, I'm really impressed. Very happy to, to see so many of you here. Um, I will be chairing the first panel in which we will um, have a few discussions by translation practitioners. So we've got three people who are here representing their NGO and the work that they're doing in terms of translation and management. And then we've got one freelancer as well. Um, we've been in touch for a while, and uh, Patricia has been very helpful for us. So I really look forward as well to hearing um, that side of you know, um, of translation for uh, NGOs. Um, I said to the speakers that they could choose more or less the order. I think Alberto has been saying all that. <laughs> <laughs> So Alberto Sanz Martins is a translation manager at Oxfam GP. He will, be, he will be giving the first talk. And then we also have Verity Leonard Hill, who's a translation manager at Save the Children, and Jessica Matthews from Family for Every Child, who was the internal communications officer but has now changed job titles at Alliance Development Coordinator. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm um, going to start off with I give the floor to you. As a power. So presentations will be more or less 15 minutes. We'll see how it goes, and then we'll take some time for discussion. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me to take part in, in these discussions, which I find really interesting and unnecessary. I'm. My name is Alberto, and I've been working for Oxfam GP as a translation manager for the last six years. The team was created more or less eight years ago, so I've been there for most of the time it's been up and running. And I'm going to give you uh, an explanation, brief explanation, on uh, the way the translation service works at Oxfam. And to do so, I'm going to, to start explaining a bit uh, how Oxfam is organized the structure of the organization, <coughs> then the translation needs, and the translation issues that led to the creation of the translation service, how the translation service works, and 
and we'll end up talking about the uh, ongoing challenges. There are quite a few, so this is great <laughs> that you guys are here to help us with this. So, Oxfam. Um, Oxfam is a confederation of 20 affiliates that work in over 90 countries. So you can imagine the, the linguistic needs are huge. And Oxfam GB is one of those 20 affiliates and it's actually the largest one and the original one. And it accounts for half of the confederation in terms of staff and probably on budget as well. Um, what Oxfam does, Oxfam's ultimate goal is to uh, overcome poverty and suffering in the world. And to do so, it focuses on three main activities, which are uh, long-term development, <coughs> uh, programs in developing countries, Campaigning, influence, advocacy to change the rules of the game and to make the um, raise awareness uh, with the population, engaging engaging with the citizenship, etc., and also influence on decision makers. And finally, of course, emergencies, uh, humanitarian action. So all what we all what Oxfam does is based on these three main activities, and of course. There's a need of business support and many other uh, business needs uh, in order to meet the, the objectives of the organization. So, this is a simplified organogram <laughs> of <laughs> just Oxfam TV. Um, there is uh, trustees, then the chief executive, and after that, one, two, three, because there used to be six, uh, seven main divisions now. And apart from these divisions, there is as well the um, global humanitarian team, which is a bit separate now because it's made of staff from all affiliates together. So it doesn't belong to specific affiliates. So in Noxman GB's specific case, we have uh, the trade, trading division, which is actually the um, network of shops we have all over UK, over 700 shops to uh, fundraise uh, money. Then we have uh, fundraising department, which is really um, complex. Uh, so we have, for example, public fundraising, street fundraising, supporter relationship, big donors, institutional donors, etc. Um, then campaign policy and influencing, basically the, the campaigns that, that Oxfam runs. Uh, program, which is the long-term development uh, programs. Communication, and you can see it's where translation sits currently. We used to belong as well to HR and other divisions. Don't know why, <laughs> but anyway, I think um, we identify, we can relate quite a lot to the communications division because at the end of the day, that's what we are. We are communicators as well. So, and then uh, finance and information systems which is uh, business support, uh, legal systems, safeguarding, IS, uh, procurement, uh, supply and logistics, which is huge and with great translation needs. And finally, uh, the people division, which is a funny way to say HR, basically. <laughs> so, um, apart from this, um, to complicate more the structure of the organization, there are many um, cross affiliate teams with other affiliates, um, dotted lines between teams, for example, women's rights and gender work a lot as well with program to integrate the gender perspective in all the programs. So it's a bit blurred sometimes and the structure changes quite a lot. Actually, we are in the middle of a changing process called Oxfam 2020, and when we're done with that, I'm sure. <laughs> It would be Oxfam 2030 or something. <laughs> Always like that. Since I joined in 2011. So, yeah. Uh, so, before the creation of the translation service, uh, there were big issues in the organization um, related to languages. There was not a policy, there, there was no way forward uh, to translation. So, every department, every team had a different way to approach their translation needs. Mm -hmm. And uh, that created many issues, uh, mainly um, quality. Quality was quite obvious. Um, quality standards were uh, very often not met. 
staff time, so people who were supposed to dedicate their time to do certain tasks, they had to spend a lot of time try, uh, trying to deal with translations and um, um, without having the expertise and uh, not being efficient with what they had to with what they were supposed to do. Um, inconsistency in terminology. Imagine. I don't know, 30 teams using different people, volunteers, trying to use their linguistic skills themselves, etc. Um, with no management of terminology whatsoever, it was quite chaotic. Rates, some teams paid a lot using some agencies, some of the teams used uh, volunteers. It was really complicated to, uh, to plan the budget for the translation needs uh, because of the chaos. And also, of course, duplication of work. Sometimes certain pro projects were translated more than once, or they were so badly translated that they needed to be retranslated, etc. So, um, because of all these reasons, a translations manager was recruited in 2009 to do extensive uh, research and an assessment of the translation needs, um, talking to every department, etc. And after um, a few months of doing this, um, um, a pilot team was launched, and after six months, the translation service was already a reality, and it was up and running. And that's exactly when I joined the organization, after the assessment. <laughs> so, <coughs> translation service. Well, in the beginning, it was just one, one person. Uh, two years later, one and a half people. Uh, a few years later, three, and now we are four uh, in-house uh, members in the translation service. So the objective of the translation service is to allow Oxfam communicate effectively with an international and multicultural, so a multilingual, uh, um, uh, international, multilingual, external, and internal audience. That's what we do in, in just one sentence. So in order to do so, uh, we have a central management of all the translations. Um, we ensure quality and cost efficiency and uh, savings and ensuring best practices are applied all the time. So this is more or less the remit of my team. Uh, of course it's more complicated than that because as we work in over 90 countries, um, it's quite unrealistic to have an, an, an internal team, an in-house team with capacity to cover all that. So, um, a few languages were selected as the strategic ones for Oxfam GP in order to uh, operate effectively with an ongoing need to translate in those languages. And those are English, Spanish, French, Arabic, and Portuguese. So, it's been like that for the last six years, but um, every two years, more or less, we tend to do another assessment just to make sure that we cover the needs because sometimes, uh, for example, Arabic in the past uh, was not a, a strategic language, but uh, the need to, uh, to translate into Arabic is growing every year, so we have to react to that and we have to have more capacity. So we don't, we don't have yet in-house capacity in Arabic, but uh, we have um, extended our pool of external providers in, in Arabic. So this is the structure of the team. <coughs> Uh, I'm the manager, and then we have a translations coordinator and two translations, translations officers. Um, apart from that, we have a pool of external translators, more or less 15, um, and the languages that we covered that I just mentioned. So, what do we do uh, in the translations team? Apart from obviously translating, there are, there's more than that. So these are the main tasks that we do. Translating, proofreading, uh, translation project management, which involves uh, negotiating budget, um, deadlines, um, gathering reference materials, and to make sure that everything is in order to, for the project to be a success. Also, linguistic resources management, like updating and improving glossaries, uh, talking to uh, experts in, in certain topics to, so that they approve the technical terminology, um, updating translation memories um, and things like that. And then strategic planning, which is something really important. 
with other strategic planning, what we do would be uh, much more difficult to do. So strategic, strategic planning means having a sound translations policy in place and make sure it's implemented, educating people on how to work with translators and what's required to make sure that they don't consider translation as an add-on at the end of the project, but uh, it's taken into account since the very early stages. That makes a huge difference. So when I first joined, many teams were still requesting 30,000 words or a whole campaign by next Monday, you know, <laughs> things, like, things like that. So now, it doesn't happen that often, but um, yeah, educating people is uh, an ongoing mm. thing that we have to do. Um, also, uh, it's important as well, whenever there are new arrivals at Oxfam, we always organize an induction, like a preemptive strike, to make sure they know uh, how to work with us and what to expect. And it, it's quite useful, actually. And it's a, a good way as well to, to do networking and so that to promote the team and everything. And I'm going to go directly to the ongoing challenges because I think it's important to, to talk about this to spark the discussion after and everything. So one of the main problems is the changing the structure. A big organization as like Oxfam, I guess it's the same case with say the children, is always going through a changing process. And we need to adapt to that. So we need to be in the know of everything, we need to talk to people, we need to improve and expand the services we provide and sometimes stop doing certain things that we used to do uh, because it's not cost efficient or it's not needed anymore. So, um, yeah, that's our reality. And it depends a, a lot on who's running the team um, to be able to follow the changing structure. So that's, if there was a way to integrate more that, like the translation service in the evolution of the organization to make the adaptation a bit smoother, that'd be, that'd be great. Um, uh, a repercussion of that is the policy. So policy, the policy needs to reflect um, what we do and why we do it. So the remit of the team and justify it. So there's a need to constantly, well not constantly, but uh, the policy has to be um, updated and has to be relevant. And actually, um, we updated it last week after two years of discussions uh, in the organization and we're waiting for the senior management final approval to have this new uh, policy defining better the remit of, of the team at what, what to expect and everything. Then specific needs, what, what I mean with this specific needs is linguistic needs of the organization that don't really fall within the remit of the team, but they still need it anyway. For example, uncommon language pairs, um, completely unexpected uh, requests for things we're not completely ready. What should we do? How can we make sure that we're ready for that? It's not a, a good image and a good message to say, uh, sorry, we cannot deal with, we are the, linguist, the, the, the language experts in the building, but we cannot deal with this. So you have to deal with it yourself. So for them it's going to be even more complicated because they're not experts at all in languages. So that's, that's an issue for us, especially now with all the refugee crisis. We have many teams deployed in all over the place and sometimes they need to interview people for a media coverage or to gather stories, etc. And the need is immediate and uh, many times in, in language first, we have no control at all. So that's quite tricky. Also resources, resources, I mean uh, budget for the team and human resources for the team. That's an issue as well and that's why the strategic plan is, is important. Um, we need to do a lot of almost lobbying. <laughs> so that they don't cut the budget for translation. It's something uh, people sometimes don't see. Mm -hmm. It's quite invisible, the work we do. If we do it well, it's quite invisible. So mm -hmm. we have to remind them that uh, in order to provide this service, 
we need people, we need budgets, we need tools, etc. So this is an important thing. Then connection with the field. Um, we are normally more in touch with uh, teams based in the UK and there's a certain distance with the reality in the field and it'd be great to have a direct, more direct connection with, um, with, with the local teams and people actually uh, using the final materials or receiving those materials. So, for example, this year I had the chance to go to Bali for a meeting and I met all the pro program managers of, of the campaign the meeting was about and I learned so much about their actual needs and about how the campaign really works. Um, I didn't even know they had a local, like a, the, the, the name of the campaign, there's a global name for it, and then every country could adapt the name and have a completely different one because it's a new way of uh, campaigning, it's country-led, and we didn't even know. So we only focused on the global materials, but we, did, we were not aware that uh, they were adapting everything after that, after the global materials to the local reality. And we could have done a much better job uh, knowing that in the first place. Then, skills. Um, normally, when you study translation, you become a language expert and you know how to do project management, translation, proofreading, using the, the travels and all the uh, software related to translation. But there's more to that. Um, I had to learn on the go how to run a budget, how to line manage someone, how to uh, influence on decision makers in the organization. And yeah, so I think it's important to not forget about that. So to prepare uh, better translation managers or translation coordinators, etc. There are more things than just the technical part. Um, otherwise, sometimes when, when a translation service is managed by someone who is not a translator, there are issues. They don't really understand the nature of what we do. So I think it's better that it's managed by a translator with extra knowledge on how to run a budget, how to do certain things. And education, the ongoing challenge I was referring to before, educating people, explaining them what to expect, how to work with translators, etc. So yeah, we do we try to do some promotion, but um, it'd be great to have better ideas or a more integrated way to promote the service or to educate people about translation across the board. And how can you see if it works better for the sake of the children? Hello everyone, thank you for having me. Um, I think my presentation actually is going to have a lot of uh, information from them down there today, so that's so good to hear. Maybe I can also talk through it quicker. Um, I'm sure there'll be chats and questions later, so uh, we'll uh, so I'm the Translations Manager at Safe Children. Um, my job is to look after any like thing fall under the rubric of language services basically. So I'll talk a bit more about that as I go on. Um, so this is going to be a stop tour, we're going to talk about the world of uh, translation at Safe for Children. Uh, how translation services are organised at Safe for Children, I don't have an amazing organogram, sadly, but I'm going to do that. Uh, how professional translation fits in at Safe for Children? So where's this place? And problems and challenges at the end. So, say that children, we work in 120 countries. And we're a family of 20 odd member organisations. So slightly different terminology, but the same sort of deal as it looks like really. Um, and with the member organisations are based around the world. And we've got about 50, well, about 17,000 staff worldwide. Uh, so it's quite a beast. Um, we have virtual sports and long-term development, so again, very similar to our fonts and we have advocacy, which sits across both. Um, our language profile. So English is the language of international communication, so our head office is in the UK, so and, uh, we have a very large member in the US and Australia. So that tends to be the language of communication. 
We uh, also have member languages. So some of our members are, um, well, we have a strong base in Scandinavia, so Danish, Swedish, Norwegian. We have uh, Cantonese, Hong Kong is a member. We also have um, emerging members, so that would be Indonesia as well. So there's a bit of a mixture there. And we're for, for our member, they will have uh, domestic programs, we call domestic programs, so they work inside that country. So the UK is a member, and our domestic programs operate in English, but also in Welsh, if we should forget. Um, and uh, in Norway, they have their domestic programs, so they work in Norwegian, so there's a, a language element there. We have regional languages. We work uh, on such a big scale that we have regional offices to manage operations in certain regions. For example, we're based in Panama for uh, South America, and their language of operation would be Spanish. Um, we have response languages. So, as many of you will see uh, in the news, we are working in Bangladesh with Eringa. And um, the response languages then vary. Some of it will be Bengali, some of it will be English to operate with other organisations, uh, coordinated in response, and some of it will be repeat itself. Uh, we have programme languages, so programmes are what we call our operations within a certain place. So they, for example, in DRC, that would be French, but also depending on our field offices, there might be other local languages. <coughs> and we have project languages. Slight differentiation between a programme, which tends to be longer term, and a project which might be a certain uh, project in a place. So, for example, a nutrition project, very specific objective, and we usually have specific funding for that, and that is where the word donor comes in. That's a really important word in our world, and that's a lot of the funding comes in. So, the role of translation at the for children. First of all, I guess I'd like to talk about what translation means to say the children. It's not just translation. Uh, we do a huge amount of other uh, language services umbrella. Uh, in proofreading, we do audio translation, subtitling, transcription is a very large part of what we do. Editing, interpreting, they can all be part of uh, what we would head comes under the heading of translation uh, for the children. Um, we talked about languages before in terms of how they're structured. This is what it looks like in reality. What languages do we deal with from the translation perspective? And it gives you a little bit of insight. I'd like to mention this already, so it's just a picture of what it looks like. 2013, Arabic looked a bit like this. 2017, So that's quite a big change. French is still a very large uh, part of our work. Spanish also. Portuguese is really English, and there are reasons for that. Other, that encompasses many, many languages from um, Hausa to Mei Mei to Oromo. There are many, many that we have to deal with. And that has changed also because we have to follow those programs. This is probably best mapped onto geopolitical forces in the world, and that kind of gives you a picture of how the world's moved on in four years, where we work, and that's just a bit of a subject of that. What do we translate? Absolutely everything that you can imagine. We have operational, so this kind of maps a little bit onto Alberto's diagram of uh, the structure. So operational, that's legal, HR, fire, IT, strategy, policies, training. Programs. So what do you need to use when you read a program? What information do you have to have? All of those things. Advocacy, reports, getting the message out there that we need to make a change in education, in nutrition for children. And then also, we uh, translation, we also translate the partners and coalition. So more and more we work with local partners in country, and um, also as part of broad coalitions, and they can have, have their own requirements as well. We are a small translation team within our massive organisation. There's just two of us. <laughs> we are both translation professionals, both translators by trade. Um, and we bring that into, as I was to say, we bring that into the role. It's, I, I don't know how you would do the role if you didn't have translation, sure. 
official background. Um, we have an agency model, so very similar again to Alberta. We outsource pretty much everything. Um, and we are the conduit for all local services. Whether or not we are the ultimate provider of that service, we're the conduit for it. So we're the expertise, uh, as I mentioned, said, we're the place that people come to if they need translation, whatever that might be under the transcription. So translations are often overarching products. So what I'm trying to say here is we might have um, a very important advocacy campaign we want to do on uh, nutrition for children under five. And that is global. And so we'll have set materials or products as part of that. They are intended for the framework so that when they go out into regions and into countries, that those countries can use them. And it, I guess it maps onto what I was saying as well. So they could use them, but also they can adapt them to the local environment and their local materials could also be produced. So it's a facilitatory. Uh, service as well. Um, I mentioned education again. We can't really, um, it has to be considered at the start. We look at the purpose of a request, so it's not just a case of tomorrow I need 30,000 words, why do you need 30,000 words tomorrow? What's the purpose? Well, all those sorts of questions are part of the job. And also, what I think translation really brings uh, to communication is that it always has an audience focus, that's the point. So that I think really helps with advocacy work particularly, to think about who the audience is, who we try to talk to, what we want to say. Um, and then we also, uh, a large part of our role is to mitigate risk. So uh, NGOs will operate with an increasingly heavily regulated environment, that could be debt protection, it could be process to child safeguarding, a large part of what we do. Financial production administration, contractual uh, obligations, don't have requirements. And within that, we have to help make sure that the language there is part of that fits with all those criteria as well. So how professional translation fits in? So as you gather, the translation agreement is huge. In order to be able to be requirements of such a large uh, organisation, you have to use professional translation. The, the risk of not being so is huge. Uh, we work with more departments and teams than anybody else will do in the organisation. Translation sits across everything. Whether you're an expert in nutrition, whether you are uh, a lawyer in the legal team, we will work with you. So it's, it's it's multidisciplinary, it's with programs and it's with operations as well. Professional translation also has hidden added value. And by that I mean, as often a comment that is made is that a source file is better, a source product is better when it's been translated because the translation informs back again of what's included in the source. So it's a better product anyway. The audience focus, as I did refer to before, cost savings, again, um, because you're doing it uh, professionally doesn't mean it costs more, it just means that you're more uh, focused and targeted at better resource. Uh, quality assurance, again, and an efficient workflow to make sure that that's not uh, taking too much time, but also that it's got the right stages in place. Translation challenges. So, I've worked to save children uh, in terms of translation for over a decade. And I would say that the challenge is pretty much the same, mm -hmm. uh, but probably you know, uh, the uh, details have changed. Um, and I would probably even say that the challenges are reflected across all the world translation itself. I don't think that they're just necessarily specific to the touch of the Quality resource is difficult to find. You've never thought, just going to read my note here because I was discussing with Pilar who I work with and we were trying to find a way of expressing this. So we don't think that you would ever be able to get to translator who will cover all specialisms within the area of international development because that goes for nutrition, health, pharmacy, education, legal, marketing. That's just such a broad area. There will never be a specialist that does all of those things. Um, but what we look for is a translator who is an excellent linguist. That's so important. 
and can adapt to the materials that we have. Ask the right questions, have research skills, and have a collaborative approach. They're really the key things for us. Um, getting to the best translators isn't always easy. It's often trial and error. And are there better ways to go about that? That's a question I guess I've got for the second panel. Even a question, can we better regulate the industry? And sourcing translators in rare languages and unlisted languages is an additional challenge. As I refer to Paul Ruffin, a huge amount of languages. And some of them are easier to source than others. So it would be great if anybody has any top tips about how to do that. Um, okay. Funding, I think this is a given. I think that uh, here on the have also we already touched on it in the research anyway. Funding is very difficult throughout the, the entire world of international funding. It's never easy. And translation happens at the end. So it's a real challenge to get people to put that at the start. It's also a little bit of an unknown because at the start of a two year project, it's very difficult to know what, what funding will you need for translation? I mean, because that will change. So there's also uh, the challenge of uh, what's the restricted funding and unrestricted funding within, uh, within just the development. So that means that you can only spend restricted funding on certain activities but you can spend unrestricted funding on any activity within your portfolio. It's very, it's harder and harder to get unrestricted funding. So where does translation sit within that? If funding is restricted for a certain project or program, can translation be a part of that? Or does it always have to be funded by the industry? That's a bit of a challenge. Another challenge is the funding and interactions that we have. They govern differently according to partnership, but also to donor. So if we're working with a local organisation, a partner, there will be certain requirements funding for that. They will be completely different to the funding that we want from a difficult project. So it's quite that's a tricky area to work with. Context. I would say the content is a challenge for various reasons. We have a dynamic content, by that I mean we don't just deal with documents anymore. Maybe 15 years ago, that was the case, but not anymore. We need new approaches to move with the times. There are so many, so many more projects that have online content, e learning, um, they might have be a PDF, but Actually, that's, that's a pain. Anybody who works with translation goes, why can't we do a PDF? I don't understand this. There are some tools we can use, but actually I haven't yet found one that's perfect. But what about that? What about when there are design efforts? I think that more and more that's falling within the sort of translation discussion. Um, quality of source text varies. Um, this is a frustration of colleagues of mine within the editorial department. Uh, people who will author a source text aren't necessarily good writers, and that can lead to a really varied quality of source text, which actually can make it very difficult for translation. So that is an issue. I wonder if there's an editing role for translation departments on the horizon. I have heard of instances where they have an editorial role as well as a translation role. Maybe that's on the cards as well. Um, oh, NGO speak. I don't know if there's a word for that, but NGO speak. It changes all the time. Uh, terminologies change. Glossaries can't keep up with it. And, and it's very difficult, and it will change. And the same term can be different six months down the line. It's, that's very difficult. Inclusive language, that's really important for us. Uh, gender, <coughs> and that's a challenge when we talk about children. Because, uh, of course, in English, child, children, we don't have to worry about mm -hmm. the, the gender of the word. French, we get away with it. Mm -hmm. Spanish, not so much. What do we do? We have to elongate everything because we don't, it's not just about a uh, union. So what, what do we do about that? Um, different partners and agencies, so I've said this before, they have different terminologies. So when we work with our Scaling Up Nutrition uh, Coalition, they have very different terminological requirements to our internal nutrition team. That, that's a real challenge. Um, and 
five really tired, and it's like, this is such a boring slide, I can't believe it. But it's, it's part of life. There are so limited resources. Resources are so limited. There are two of us for an organisation that's being a save the children. That's just crazy. But where do you take resources away from? Because there is a limit to everybody in the organisation. So what's, what's, how, do we, how do we deal with that? Um, everything's urgent. Everything is urgent. What urgent means goes back to a few slides where I said we interrogate that. What does urgent really mean for you? Is it really? Is it urgent or is it just sort of you'd like it quite soon? That, that's a constant conversation. Um, transition comes last, same with funding. We're the most squeezed for time for sure. Education is a massive role in that, definitely, working with our colleagues. But it will always be last, so how, how do we manage that better? How do we get that education up front a bit more? Um, technical and logical solutions are not always accessible because of lack of investment mostly uh, with time and funding and that's tricky because there are some solutions out there that we'd love to use but we just can't so how do we bridge that gap? Um, compliance is as in heavy I mentioned the regular military environment we work in that takes time to sort out DBS, which is Disclosure Barring Service, for any of you who don't know, if we're working with children, we have to have checks in place, and that takes time in administration. Um, quality, quality assurance, you need time to do that, you need resources. That's difficult when you have to have a job out the door next week. But you could really do with a couple of extra days just to talk to the team in country and say, is this okay? What, what could we be working with? That's a challenge. And dare I say it as my last point, Brexit. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, um, thanks for having me, it's been at um, Hillary. Um, so I'm Jessica Matthews, I'm from Family for Every Child, which is an international alliance of organisations working in their own contexts on aspects of children's care. So this slide illustrates it nicely. Um, yeah, we're 32 members in 30 countries, all national civil society organisations, so uniquely placed in their own communities, working for vulnerable children and families. Um, so we're slightly different to Oxfam and SAVE in that we, whilst we're non-governmental, we wouldn't describe ourselves as an INGO, we are an alliance of civil society organisations. Um, so similar to the previous two presentations, I'm going to give you an overview of family, as we like to term it. It's a bit of a mouthful to say everything. <laughs> um, family with a capital F. And um, then going to talk about the, the role of translation in family, how it's organised, and then go on to the challenges. Um, so quite a similar pattern there. Um, and I've kept it quite brief with the slides, so we just have to, well, I've got one more, but then it's back to the mat. <laughs> um, so, yes, um, basically, we, uh, together, our members believe that they have, they can achieve wider change and more long-term change for children by coming together. Um, and this change is focused on, well, five goals, but two of which are prioritised. And they are ensuring that children can grow up in permanent, safe and caring families. Um, this then specifically means that we focus on preventing separation of families by supporting vulnerable families and um, enabling the quality reintegration of children who are outside of adult care into families. And also then for those children who can't be cared for in a family, ensuring a range of high quality alternative care choices, so whether that's foster care, adoption, kinship care, etc. Um, so what this means in practice is that we work in these four key areas. Um, so our members come together to influence local, national and um, regional and global level uh, decision makers and they believe that you know, together they have a stronger voice to advocate for change to childcare reform. Um, practice development, which is 
members coming together to share learning, share experience and expertise. Um, pilot new approaches, for example. So just to kind of bring that to life, we've got um, uh, had a group working on foster care, where in some countries there's no no formal foster care provision. So um, those countries would come together and perhaps visit another country, do a practice exchange, learn how to influence their government to to build up formal foster care. Um, then this work is kind of these two key areas are are strengthened by our research. So that's researching at the country level to get really context-specific solutions to what works for children in, in those communities um, in order to then create the evidence to influence change. And also our knowledge sharing. So that's a real, real critical part of the network, um, fostering this continued sharing of ideas and experience. Um, and we believe that the, it's the global transfer, of, transfer and exchange of knowledge rather than the transfer of funds that will achieve this longer term change for children. Um, so where do I fit into that? I'm part of the Global Secretariat. So we're a small but diverse team of 23 people. Um, and one of my colleagues uses the um, let's use an analogy that we're like the civil servants to the members. So they are the network. The network is the members, the 32 members. Um, uh, we are the, we're the kind of behind the scenes. Um, and we're based across the world, so we all work remotely. We, we've moved away from this um, kind of UK, London-centric um, model, um, although out of the 23, I think, it's still about 13, 14 of us based in the UK, but I've come down from Sheffield today, so I can work from home, we don't have to be in London. Um, and we support the membership to deliver our strategy by doing the kind of things you would imagine, um, fundraising and communications, helping to facilitate projects, um, sometimes bringing in um, expertise and specialisms from either outside or within the Secretariat. Um, supporting the knowledge collection and dissemination, and then scoping for new members. So we are continually growing as an alliance as well. Um, we've been set up in 2011, when family was first born, um, and yeah, constantly growing. So this, this map, our core designer, is gonna have to keep developing the map and find new ways to display <laughs> all, all the members. Um, so, how does translation fit in? Well, as you can see, it's a global organisation. Um, there's a huge amount of diversity, and so we have to be um, multilingual. We have to be open to be able to communicate in different languages. And that's always been the aim of family, as I said, moving away from this English-centric um, model. Um, and so, we have four official languages. So in addition to English, we have, English uh, we have Spanish, Arabic, and Russian. Um, and I think that's based on the, some of the founding members. Um, back in 2011, when it was just a handful of members, those languages were represented. Um, so yeah, as you can see, a little bit of number crunching. We've got uh, five Spanish-speaking members, but then also two in Brazil. Um, so seven Latin America, uh, two Russian-speaking members of Kyrgyzstan and Russia, and then four Arabic-speaking members. Um, but even off the whole membership, I've had a bit of an estimate that, well, there's about 15 who might uh, have English as a working language. In fact, only five would have English as their first language. So we're still communicating with people who don't have English as their first language. So that, that requires us to be very aware of how we communicate, um, you know, being concise and simple in our, the English to start with before we even consider translation. Um, so, official documentation would be translated into these key languages, the official languages. Um, that's things like 
uh, our strategy, our conceptual framework, um, our theory of change. Uh, and in addition to those, there's a few languages where the key contact in that member organization um, doesn't really speak English. So Indonesian, for example, and Turkish until recently, the key contact didn't have English. So we have a lot of documentation also translated into other languages. Um, we're also, as a member-led network, our board is primarily made up of member trustees. So um, it's eight out of the 11 board members are elected by the wider membership, and they are generally heads of their organizations. Um, and this year, we had the first a trustee elected who's a non-English speaker. So that's posed a new challenge at kind of governance level. And for the quarterly board meetings, two of which are online, two are face-to-face -face interpretation is used for those. Um, and another kind of aspect of the official uses of translation is our annual assembly of members. So it's once a year, uh, one representative from each member comes together and it's where the annual general meeting takes place so that things like they do the elections for new trustees if that happens, um, all the business things and then there's also thematic workshops happening to develop the work that we'll then they'll work on together throughout the rest of the year. Um, and for that all documentation will be translated um, and it's actually happening this week in Guatemala. I'm not there myself, obviously, um, but yeah, the past few weeks have been quite hectic organising all of this translation. Um, and then actually on site at the meeting we provide interpreting, simultaneous interpretation for the delegates in the meeting, so it's quite a big thing to get your head around, um, especially for those colleagues who don't have any linguistic background, but um, yeah, but the, I think we've got four key languages uh, being interpreted there for this week. Um, so in addition to those areas, there's then the less formal usages of translation, and that's in really the day-to-day -day communication that we as the Secretariat would have with members. Um, and so, you know, even just as simple as emails, um, and given that we're, we're an international alliance and everyone's based around the world, we rely heavily on online communication. Um, so webinars um, as a learning tool are a key form, um, of a key way that within the alliance members would learn from each other. Um, so we have interpreting needs there. Um, we also have a monthly newsletter um, for members to share information about their own work and what they're working on together, which we get translated from English into uh, the three official languages. Um, and for that, we use a web-based translation um, company who actually are able to integrate with MailChimp, which is the newsletter software that we use. Um, so, yeah, we're kind of what you were saying, Verity, we're always trying to find these technological solutions to support <coughs> um, So, in terms of my role, we would love to have a translation <laughs> department like you guys do. Um, obviously, we're very small uh, in relation, as a secretariat, we're incredibly small in relation to, say, the Um So, we don't have a translation department. We don't have um, professional translators. Um, my role as an alliance in the alliance development team is to facilitate communication between members, so the information flow, so that basically they need to know what each other's doing in their own context in order to collaborate together on something that could benefit them at local level or together create change at national or international level. So it's really important that we can capture what all members are doing in their own context um, and then we would sometimes if they're, they're doing research projects together and there's a publication at the end of that have the need to to translate that into various languages um, 
So I, I work at Family part-time um, and do some part-time work as a freelance translator and a background in languages. Um, but I'm not employed at Family for my translation. Um, and there's a few of us within the Secretariat who have language skills which are always drawn upon. Um, but it's in a much more informal way. It's a kind of, oh, there's a call with Brazil tomorrow. Can you, can you sit in on this call and, and translate? Because we'd, we'd rather not pay for, a translate, pay for an interpreter um, at times. And it might be something that I've not been involved in this particular project, but yeah, OK, sure. Um, and so it's, there's kind of a fair bit of muddling through. Um, but then at the same time, kind of going on to how we organize the services, Whilst it's not centrally held, um, we do have a contract with a translation agency. Um, prior to that, we worked with um, freelancers, and this was before my time at Family, but from what I've understood is that they very, provided very good quality translations. However, the volume and the needs for our translations were increasing, so it was felt that an agency would be would be better to go through for cost effectiveness for the volume that we had uh, and then colleagues then found out that actually it wasn't better from a, the cost point of view it was more expensive um, however uh, it did enable that quick turnaround so like the whole thing of oh I need this many words for tomorrow um, it enables that and um, yeah the, the bulk Kind of ordering, I guess. Um, so that's that's one one thing we have. Uh, but then we also use this web-based um, translation agency for the newsletter. Uh, I'll come on to that, but that's kind of one of our challenges. Um, bring some challenges. And then also, I hate to say it as a linguist, but Google Translate it's used a lot, um, and that's for the general the general emails because we. We're in touch with the members on different things. Like, Can we organise a webinar? Would you like to present it? And if, if I mean, you can do it one of two ways: write in English, and then they will Google Translate because they don't understand the English, or we'd write the English and then Google Translate underneath. Um, you know, for, for our Indonesian member, for example, you just think, well, let's make his life a bit easy, and I'll just do that quickly and put the Indonesian underneath. Um, and that's used a lot. And I find. I like to think that when I, if I ever use it, that I'll do a check afterwards. Not of Indonesian, because I don't really know any, but um, I'm a Portuguese and French speaker, so my Spanish has, has improved through working at family, and I like to think, oh, I can, I can check over the Google Translate and just, just have more of a critical eye than some people who don't have any kind of language background would. Um, but yes, it is used. Um, so that brings me on to the challenges. Um, and I guess I've touched on them already, the, the cost effectiveness, the value for money. As a charitable organisation, we always have to exercise judgment on what is the best use of funds. Um, and as much as we'd love to have everything available in all the languages, it's not really viable. Um, so then there's, uh, that comes on to the, the, the kind of difference between the agency the traditional translation agency and the, the web-based translation um, because we know that the web-based translation would be a lot cheaper but the accuracy the consistency isn't going to be there because they they use machine translation and then have it proofread by native speakers who aren't even qualified translators um, but things like our newsletter uh, it's allowed us that, that kind of smooth operations in a sense because they have that integration with our use to software. So it's kind of a, I don't know what to say that better than nothing because that's not really what we want, but at least you know we have a, on a monthly basis the members know they're going to receive that news in Spanish, Arabic, Russian as well as English. Um, then the, that brings me on to the accuracy and we do have, obviously there's key terminology within the development sector but also specific to childcare so even even recently there's differences between um, European Spanish and Latin American Spanish on 
uh, what the terms for um, alternative care, residential care, foster care. So things like that, we, we really have to be specific. Um, and so we've developed glossaries in our key languages, and I believe that was done with the support of the freelancers that we worked with previously. Um, However, the question is sometimes, are they always used by the translation agency? Sometimes we get work back and we think, well, that's clearly, clearly in our glossary. Why, why isn't it um, you know, translated as such? Uh, then with interpreters, so as I mentioned for webinars, we would use, use interpreters a lot. Um, you just don't know if something's been mistranslated until afterwards when the member will get feedback and say, actually it wasn't very good you know, one of our own staff members may have would have done a better job um, so that's difficult obviously then um, well things like Arabic with different dialects across the location of our members poses a challenge and also just the sheer different number of accents in English when we have so many people who English isn't their first language so that can be a challenge for an interpreter um, as I said we do use staff in-house a lot um, the bonuses of that is that it um, keeps the knowledge in the house and develops the knowledge, also develops relationships. Um, but as no one's employed as a professional interpreter or translator, it's always in addition to their to their role. So it's a bit of an overstretch, and obviously then the, the quality isn't as good. You're not using a professional translator. Um, and I think the fact that we rely so heavily on online communications is um, a challenge in itself. Um, we're always looking at new ways that we can provide um, multilingual content for members. So um, I've recently been developing this members intranet site um, so that members can not only find key documentation about their membership and about family, also for them to collaborate together during the year when they're not when they're not meeting face to face um, just to be able to work on documents together for example and not not just be going by email all the time so this at the moment is only in English um, there's all the official documents are there in the translated versions however it, I, I do believe that there's members who are just won't access it because they're put off by the fact that they can't even navigate the pages because they're only in English. Um, and at the moment, yeah, I guess it comes back to resources, cost and human resources that we don't have a, uh, we currently don't have the funds to be able to develop a bespoke system that could do all of this. Um, we don't have a web developer in-house, etc. So we're still exploring new ways, um, and for the webinars, a recent example was um, a webinar talking about a, a, one of our members in Brazil, Projeto Legal. They were they had a new idea for a project on um, children affected by sexual violence. So they wanted to share that with other members. Held a webinar, members came. Many of the uh, Latin American members who, whilst face to face they would muddle through, uh, our Brazilian member wasn't confident enough to speak in Spanish. Um, so we hired an interpreter, um, Portuguese Spanish interpreter. Uh, but then we had our member in Zimbabwe, Farm Orphan Support Trust, said, This sounds great, I really want to join here about what they're doing in Brazil. Okay, right now we need Portuguese English in there. So then, then I was brought in to do that as a not an interpreter, some translation background, but um, because it was felt like, well, we're spending money on the Portuguese Spanish, we'll keep that in house so it's not an extra cost. But of course, te technology wise, mm -hmm. this is then trying to have three languages in one go. Um, so we use some video software called Zoom, some of you may be familiar with, similar to Skype. Um, we mainly use Zoom, so then we thought, okay, we'll have Zoom for the Portuguese Spanish, and then I'll be on Skype with the colleague in Zimbabwe, listening to the Zoom, but talking to him in English. <laughs> no. <laughs> 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 and it was funny because all the guy in Zimbabwe, his name's Blessing, and he wasn't able to, he kind of, his um, connection cut out, 
Mm. And I just thought, what a blessing. Because <laughs> 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 I was struggling to hear the Portuguese with hearing the Spanish at the same time. Mm. And then trying to go into English. And, well, yeah, it was a mess. So we thought, right, never again will we try a trilingual webinar. Um, but it's made us realise, okay, we really need to address how this could be done. Um, there could be ways around it. So, yes, they're the main challenges. Um, and I guess just to say that in terms of whether it's improving, changing, that one thing is that we're, we're moving away gradually, although we've always aimed not to be English-centric, there, there still are, you know, it's, it still is that to, to some extent, given that um, the majority of the Secretariat are uh, native English speakers. So, um, but we are becoming more attuned to the needs of being a multilingual network and it's only going to kind of become growing in that direction. Um, our new member in Morocco has only recently joined um, Arabic speakers but also French so uh, and we may then be looking for a new member in French speaking West Africa so yeah it's the needs are going to continue so we need to keep adapting to that um, and I guess in terms of in the future it would be great to not to think of language pairs where English isn't even involved. So we ideally want this member-to-member -member collaboration without the secretariat. It doesn't always have to come through us as with gatekeepers, but you know, if uh, Ivan, who's the head of uh, Paikabi in Chile, if he wants to talk to um, uh, Isan uh, Mohammadiyah in Indonesia, then, then why not? That would be great. But we, we don't have to get involved in an Indonesian to Spanish <laughs> chat, but how can we make, how can we facilitate um, that to happen? Um, and that would be the real beauty of the network, I guess, for them to be able to share that. And so that resources in Indonesia aren't lost, that could be so so valuable to someone in, in Guatemala. Um, they could learn so so much from them, but that we really have to consider the language uses to make it accessible. Hello everybody. How many of you are practicing translators? Quite a few. How many translate into French? <laughs> yeah, okay. So I won't bore you too much with French examples because there aren't many of you. So my name is Patricia Sommer. I'm French. I translate from English into French. I'm a member of the Institute of Translation and Interpreting. I'm also a member of the Society of Authors. I've just realized I forgot to push the key. <laughs> My postmaster's degree is a DSS de traducteur spécialisé from the University of Lille. I have more than 30 years experience as a translator, including seven years in-house in a translation agency. And I currently, I'm currently co-director of Manzana Business Solutions Limited with my husband, Paul Apolliard, who is vice chair of ITI and translates into English. So, my experience of work with NGOs. I work with several NGOs, some directly and some through uh, translation agencies. I've been specializing in international development for about 15 years. And my work in the development area uh, accounts for about 80% of my turnover. So quite, quite a big chunk. I'm also registered with Translators Without Borders. The type of work I undertake, mainly, well, only I would say, translation and proofreading. I don't do interpreting. And the types of documents I translate are <coughs> mainly reports and training courses. I find these are the two <coughs> biggest area of work. But also, of course, there are many other things that we translate. Newsletters, press releases, correspondence, job adverts, questionnaires, survival stories, websites, concept notes, brand identity guidelines, slogans, and many more. For one of the NGO I work with uh, through a translation agency, uh, they organize a lot of um, conferences, and for each conference I have to translate absolutely everything, from the delegate manual to the position statements, the minutes, the reports, even the menus, you know, everything. <laughs> It's very, very, very. So, next slide. I was asked by Rina and Hilary to answer a set of questions. So the first one was, how do you communicate with the NGOs you receive work for? Then, do NGOs provide you with translation tools? 
what are the main problems, challenges? Do you have the opportunity to network with other translators? And what sort of additional support would you like to have? So I'm going to answer all these questions. I mean, some some uh, questions I will spend a lot of time on, and others not very much at all. Communications with NGOs. 90% of the texts sent by NGOs are sent by email in various formats. It can be Word documents, PDFs, um, H HTML files, Excel, PowerPoint. And occasionally, especially for proofreading, I work directly online um, on some projects we're able to review and annotate the content online. And one of the programs we use is uh, Review My Learning. I don't know if you've ever worked with that. We also use Google Docs uh, to share, termino share the terminology with several translators working on the same project. Now, a word about the difference between working directly with NGOs and working for NGOs through translation agencies. NGOs do not provide you with translation memories, but agencies which send work to different translators often build their own translation memory and they send it to you and you're supposed to use that. And of course, that has got advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is supposed to be that the terminology is going to be consistent. But the disadvantage is that very often translators disagree with each other. And you find, you find the name of a translator and they don't use the same term as you. So it sort of backfires. Um, also, agencies don't put you directly in touch with the NGO. Um, so obviously, that, that's a problem. Because if you have queries, then you get delays and sometimes misunderstandings. Whilst I'm on the subject of translation memories, I work with <coughs> memory queue. So the way I work is I've got um, one memory per NGO, and I use um, my master memory my, um, for the NGO I'm, I'm working for, but also have all my other memories in the background so I can use the resources, the terminology from all my secondary memories. So, oh, sorry, I forgot to do that. That was communication <laughs> with NGOs. <laughs> right, main problems and challenges in translating with NGOs. This is the, obviously the largest part of the presentation. Technical problems, linguistic problems, content, competition, and prices. Some of the linguistic problems uh, Verity has already spoken about, and that's because we do a lot of work together, so you will find that we, we, we have the same challenges. <laughs> so first of all, the technical challenges are conversion from PDF to Word. Have we all suffered with that at one point or another? Um, translating content for online projects. Uh, we very often receive the text as strings with, with um, programming codes embedded with no context. And what happens is at the end, once when it's up, uploaded somewhere, we have to review everything and it takes an awful lot of time because we've had that problem in the first place. The linguistic challenges, a lot of challenges. First of all, and Verity mentioned that, the difficulty of understanding the source text because many writers are non-native speakers or non-native yeah, non writers. Also, there's a lot of jargon and abbreviation and acronyms being used in text for international development. That makes reading the text in English difficult and that makes it even more difficult in French because we don't, as a language, we don't really like abbreviations and acronyms, so we don't like it if you've got two or three in one sentence. It's sort of, so we tend to use the extended form of the abbreviation, but that can lead to repetitions. And in French, we hate repetitions. So we, we sort of, we've got Cash 22 situation where we have to Make, make the best of, of what we've got, basically, and sort of find the right balance between using these uh, abbreviations or using the extended form. Also, some abbreviations and acronyms have official translation in French, for example, you know, WHO, OMS, etc. Um, but others don't. So then you have to decide when you translate whether you 
keep the English abbreviation or whether you invent your own French abbreviation. And that also is a problem because the next translator might not use the same French abbreviation as you. So the other, the other problem that, that poses is that if you leave some English abbreviations and you have some French abbreviation in the same text, it's a bit confusing for the reader, so that's um, something that we have, again, to think about. Um, another problem, another problem is that, and I'm sure you've all had that at one point or another, is between the time you get the first text to translate and the time you finish the translation, very often you're given two or three updated versions. And obviously that takes time again, that's you know, very frustrating for us. Uh, Verity mentioned that briefly, uh, there are also different terminology in the target language between different NGOs, but also within the same NGO. For example, focal point, um, we use personne de référence, but I've got another NGO and they use agent de liaison for the same thing. And sometimes within the same organization, and I'm picking up Verity now, <laughs> she, we use per person de référence most of the time, but when we work for the Scaling Up Nutrition program, we use point focal. <laughs> so a lot of um, problems there. Um, also, the reference material often uses different terminology. If you look up um, the glossary, the UN glossary, and then you go to um, uh, the World Health Organization website and you compare the text side by side to try and find vocabulary. You find they don't always use the, te the same terms, not exactly. So as a translator, you have to decide which to choose, basically. Um, also, sometimes in English, you have words which seem to be synonymous. Like, for example, protection and safeguarding. Again, we're talking about children there. Uh, but actually, they don't mean the same thing. So you can't use protection in French for both of them. You have to make a difference. And what we did for that term, I say to children, we had a discussion which involved translators and also people on the, in the field, I believe. Um, and we came up with défense des enfants for safeguarding. And this term is now being used not only by child, save the children, also its partners and others in the field. So that's an important thing that we do. Also, another challenge, I mean, it's quite fun, that one, <laughs> is creating slogans and titles of campaigns. It takes ages, but it's, it's quite satisfying when you get it right. Uh, for example, every last child became aucun enfant oublié. Okay. that one. <laughs> um, Verity also mentioned the, the gender inclusiveness problem. I've had something recently with the word survivor in English, which of course can be ma male or female, but and usually when you talk about survivors, you talk about women because it's you know, to do with sexual violence, etc. Um, but actually in that particular text, there were also males, male survivors. So then we have to go back to the author and say, excuse me, in this paragraph, do you mean just females or do you mean male and females? So that's another thing to think about. Um, okay, content. Oops, that's mine. Oh, did I miss that bit? Right, never mind. Content. Um, the actual content that we translate can be very upsetting, and I'm sure if you translate for international development, you have had that problem. And the translator might have to protect themselves in some way. It's probably more true for interpreters than translators, but even for translators, sometimes what we translate can be very, very upsetting. And there was an interesting article in the last ITI bulletin by Severine Hoopshed Davidson. She doesn't happen to be here, but she doesn't. <laughs> it was very interesting. It was about, how, um, about translators' emotions. It was called Once More with Feeling. And uh, basically, she was going through the different strategies that translators can um, try and use to protect themselves from upsetting content. My personal experience, the 
very worst was the translation of report about children being abused by UN soldiers. <coughs> And another one about sexual violence against women in um, DRC, and for that one I was actually offered counselling. So, quite, quite hard. Okay, I'm just uh, slightly concerned that I've missed the page. Competition. No, I'm ahead of myself. That's number four. Competition. Many translators don't consider international development as a proper specialization. And I'm saying that with my proofreader's hat on. That sometimes the things we proofread are really not, not good enough. Um, Verity mentioned that. Apart from the jargon, you need to have a good basic knowledge in a variety of fields. Of course, you can't be a specialist in everything, as we said. Uh, but it's extremely varied. You can have um, technical vocabulary, for example, how to build a latrine. You can have medical vocabulary, illness, childbirth, nutrition. You can have uh, pharmaceutical vocabulary with vaccination, even printing terminology uh, with brand identity guidelines. Remember that, Pilar. <laughs> Education, legal contracts, etc. So to be a good translator in development, you must be a good researcher and like a challenge. Prices. Translation is underfunded. Vina and Hillary's research, uh, that was one of the conclusions. Consequently, rates paid to translators by NGOs are low. Also, there's another problem. Um, uh, that's a problem I have, but you might not have it because, um, I charge VAT, and I have found out that NGOs can't claim back the total amount of VAT, which means that many of them can't afford to use translators who are VAT registered. I think that it would be a good thing if NGO could claim all the VAT back, but obviously I'm not an expert, so it's probably not possible. So that's that. Opportunity to network with other translators. So that's not a random picture of wine. That was actually the, the, the French network. It was our, it was our um, Fête des Rois, which we do every year. So, but that's also a very good opportunity for networking. <laughs> Some NGOs will put you in touch with other translators, uh, but youth agencies usually don't. That's another difference. Also, um, at Save the Children, we have a really good team of translators and proofreaders, and I'm on Skype with some of them, and what we tend to do is we discuss the problems as they arise. We don't sort of wait until the translation is finished and we get to the proofreading stage. We, we tend to discuss the problems as and when, which saves a lot of time, and also it's, it's very interesting to have the you know, the exchange with someone else. And in fact, with one particular translator, I'm trying not to look at her, she's in the room, <laughs> we exchange free proofreading time as well. So if, if we work for somebody else, we can also sort of help each other that way. Um, additional support needed. This is support. <laughs> I didn't know how to. <laughs> Things to make our life easier. No PDF files, other for guidance, <laughs> other than for guidance on the layout, because most files start their lives in a more editable form. Not using Excel for text, that is really one of my pet hates. It's meant for numbers, not thousands of words. It's just incredibly difficult to, to work with. Easier access to the actual website when you translate part of the website. Sometimes you need to have a password. Sometimes you need to register. It's you know all extra steps that we have to go through. Um, and also when you're proofreading, this is my personal experience. So when you proofread uh, a, a training, um, training content online, you know how you have basically the, 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 the course itself. And then you have a quiz at the end of each section to make sure that the um, person has understood the course uh, correctly. Well, what happens is when you have a quiz, as a proofreader, you have to answer all the questions yourself. And if you can't, you can't get to the next page. <laughs> so you 
imagine how frustrating that can be. So I think a good idea would be to have the answers, maybe other people can come. I've talked about that afterwards, actually. That would be a solution. Um, on the other hand, it's good for CPD, because you learn a lot by having to get it right. So it's not all bad. Plus, sometimes we don't know where the text will go until the very end, when we work on, on websites. And reviewing at the end can be quite time consuming. Um, what else? More precise information on the target audience. That would be very useful. But obviously, we have a big idea who the translation is for, and we can ask the client. But sometimes it's not quite clear if it's going to be for donors or general public or um, international development community. It would be very good to have a better idea who the text is aiming at. And my personal opinion is that we should have better written source text. I think you mentioned that too. There is a tendency to ramble and repeat things <laughs> in, in, um, in reports mainly in reports, and what happens is you get to the end of the report and you think, I'm sure I've translated that yes. three or four times already. <laughs> yeah. And you think, hold on a second, if it, if it was shorter, people would want to read it more, you know, because basically these things are 10, 20,000 words long, so they repeat the same thing, they don't need to repeat the same thing, there should be more to the point, and so if, if that were the case, there would then be more readable, basically. They would be easier to translate, and if they were shorter, they would cost less to translate, and that means the translators would be paid more. <laughs> 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 Thank you for listening.